Okay, today is um, Friday, the 15th of September 2017. I am at the office of a gracious gentleman, a man of the Lord, and he's well known in this area, having recently been assigned to this a church next door known as, what's the name of the church, yeah, Father? St. Catherine Siena. St. Catherine Siena. And I'm going to interview him in respect to his background, and what is his projection for the religion and its spiritual deliverance. So here is the gracious father. Hello. <laughs> okay. So you are? I'm, I'm Father David Reitzel. Okay. And you, how long have you been a priest here? Uh, here I've only been a priest for about three months at St. Catherine of okay. Siena, but in total um, I've been a priest for just one year, just over a year. Okay, but what motivated you to be a priest? Okay, um, well, uh, yeah. growing up I was always Christian, okay. um, grew up in a Catholic family, we okay. went to Mass uh, regularly, and throughout high school, I kind of fell away from the faith a bit, not completely, but just in terms of the practice of the faith, it didn't, it ceased to be something very important in my life. And it wasn't until university that I started coming back to the faith, particularly through a friend who himself rediscovered his Catholic faith of his youth and started taking it on himself and taking it very seriously. And when we went to the same university, he encouraged me to start doing it uh, myself. Okay, um, were your parents Catholic? My parents were both Catholic, yes. So you were in the church from early, from the early stages of your life? Yep, I was baptized about two months after I was born, um, received all of the sacraments, uh, First Communion at grade two, confirmation in grade eight, went to a Catholic grade school, went to a Catholic high school, so certainly Catholicism was a part of my upbringing. Okay, all so you were indoctrinated in the religion from an early age, <laughs> and you pursued it for a long time until you went to the university. What did you, which university did you go to? Well, I went to the University of Waterloo. Okay, and you, you graduated in what field? Uh, I didn't actually graduate. It was my second year of university. That, that same friend that I said was encouraging me to grow in my faith, he, um, he asked me uh, if I would consider becoming a priest, which I had never really thought of. Um, he was thinking about it, though. And so he wanted me to drive him down to a seminary, which is a place where priests study, um, for a kind of a week-long retreat that the seminary was hosting for young men who were thinking of joining the seminary and wanted to visit to take a look at it. And uh, it was while I drove him down there, um, and while I was visiting there, that I was praying, talking with the priests there. They would give us conferences and things like that. And it was there that I really started thinking, uh, not necessarily that God wanted me to become a priest, but they at least convinced me um, that God has a plan for each one of our lives that's more than just kind of a general desire for our good. Um, I mean, parents, for example, they have a general desire uh, for our good. They want us to be happy. And that's what I projected on God, was that he doesn't have any specifics, but he just wants me to be good and be happy. Um, so would you say that this was a divine calling? Well, in the end, um, it has to be a divine calling. But you know, the, the, the inner voice within you didn't say, my dear son, I'm inviting you, I'm speaking to you. I want you to be a messenger, my messenger on this earth. Did you have something like that? Kind of. Okay. Um, I remember, so after visiting the seminary, um, I started asking God, does he have a particular plan for my life? And I remember the first time I asked him, I got no response. Um, but I was encouraged, keep on asking him until you figure out what it is that he wants for my life. And so, and I do remember at the end of four months of continuously praying and asking God, um, whether he wanted me to be a priest, whether he wanted me to continue studying, what, what it is that he wanted. Uh, I remember kneeling in the chapel asking him, God, do you want to become a priest? And I heard internally um, him say yes. 
I want you to become a priest. So you give expression to the biblical saying that many are called but few are chosen. I guess that's true. Um, I never really thought about it in that particular, re in reference to that particular passage. But the, the question is in Canada they, we have about, the population is about 38 million people and how many priests do we have? And you are one of those few chosen people to be a priest. It's true that we don't have uh, too, too many priests in Canada. It's not a huge uh, population of us. And it is a great honor to be called to, so, to be a priest. So. Okay, so what you, what you, have, what you have this, just disclosed that, um, disclosed that you went to a period of um, contemplation, meditation, to ask God to, to deliver your soul to Him as a human being to, mm -hmm. to continue what Jesus Christ had preached. Conversion, okay, to be a priest, okay. Would you say that was a period of meditation you, that um, the, the, the calling was derived because you meditated and asked God for um, that gift of you to be a priest? Is that a gift? Do you consider it to be a gift? Certainly. Okay. Absolutely a gift. Okay. Having chosen, having now decided to be a priest, now can you tell me your, you had gone to the seminary and what was it like in the semin seminary to be a priest? What hurdle did you cause? Did you ever decide to withdraw from it because of pressure? But before that, before that, huh? Um, is there a qualification for somebody being um, recruited as a candidate in the priesthood by way of assessment, physical assessment, emotional um, um, suitability and so on? Or? There is. Um, we all go through a mental, um, psychological evaluation. Where, do in, um, the priest, in the priesthood also? Like, at the beginning of seminary. Oh, I see. Uh, just to make sure um, that the person who comes in, because all of us, uh, claim that we've been called by God. No one goes into seminary saying, um, I don't know what God wants for my life, but I know what I want, and I want to become a priest. That's not a good approach. It always needs to be that I think genuinely that God is calling me to be a priest. So it's possible that someone actually hears voices, <laughs> um, and they're, they, uh, they, they may have um, some mental illness. And so just to rule that out, and to make sure that these callings that people are receiving are, are genuine um, religious experiences, inner callings and promptings from God. We, we just start off with a mental evaluation. So the mental evaluation, <laughs> does it require a psychiatrist? Um, no, psych no. Psychologists or whatever? I'm not sure who the, what the qualifications of the person were, but we had to do uh, a bunch of tests where they ask you like 900 questions, yes or no, or I feel strongly or weakly and, and things like that about all these minute details. Um, in so order it, was not, uh, it was not a, um, a face-to-face evaluation or questioning? Parts of it were, and then parts of it were written. Okay, so, so somebody would have interviewed you and yep. probably a um, yeah. psychiatrist or whatever. I must congratulate you, first of all, for having passed those tests, <laughs> and now we have entered the seminary, okay? Yes. Can you say something about the seminary for me? That is, your experience there and... Well, um... Having entered seminary, uh, thinking and being somewhat sure that God was calling me to become a priest, um, I was looking for kind of external signs to see whether, well, I'm here, is God going to show me that, yes, I am in the right place? Um, and I thought, you know what, this will be a good place for him to show me that because I was studying engineering before I entered into seminary. And so I was used to writing math equations. I wasn't used to writing essays and reading, doing long readings and things like that. So I figured if this in fact is God's calling for me, he's going to have to provide me the, the strength and the ability to be able to write essays, to, to be able to do long readings and understand them and, and really take them in. Um, and so when I entered seminary, I admit I did struggle right off the bat um, to be able to write, to be able to read, um, and really kind of delve into the, the, the content of the reading. But you know what? I kept on putting effort in, and God really supported me in that, because 
the amount that I grew just within a single semester from September to December um, was immense. And in December, when I looked back, I was able to say, you know, as much as a part of that is my own hard work, like I, I put effort in, I can see just God working and helping me along the way, which confirmed that in fact, that moment in the chapel where he said, I want you to become a priest, wasn't just kind of a figment of my imagination. Um, it was real. And now he's kind of making good on his calling by giving me all the things necessary to fulfill it. So. Well, you make me from the statement you made there, you made me believe that you didn't have full confidence in God. No, I, I didn't have full confidence that he was calling me to the priesthood. I had an inkling, an idea. That moment in the chapel obviously was very integral to me thinking that God was calling me to this. But I mean, it's hard to base your entire life on a single moment. Um, and God rarely works that way. He speaks once and then is quiet for the rest. He speaks once and he, he expects you to then take a step to do something with that message. But then, once you do something with it, he's going to continue to support you and guide you along the way. And by experiencing that support and the, that guidance, you're then reconfirmed that that initial calling was in fact real. Okay, so um, you then had full confidence and faith in God that your dream would have realized and everything went smoothly from there. Pretty much, like, apart from, I mean, Every semester had its own challenges, okay. new subjects to study. Um, it still took a lot of effort and a lot of work, but you're right, there was no major upsets throughout the entire process. Okay, since you spoke about subject, can you um, expand on what subject you did? Um, okay. Yeah. Well, in order to become a priest, you need to get basically two degrees, um, mm -hmm. philosophy and theology. If you already have a degree, say in engineering or something, you can do just a quick one-year philosophy catch-up mm -hmm. um, and then go on to theology. If you don't have a degree, which I didn't, you need to get the full degree in philosophy. Okay. Um, and so subjects that we would study in philosophy class, we would do the history of philosophy, going all the way right from the beginning with the Greeks uh, and Socrates, going all the way up to uh, modern, uh, throughout the medie medieval times, up to modern times, um, with all of these different philosophers and kind of going through what they did um, and what they taught. Then we would also have other classes that were focused on specific subjects within philosophy, so epistemology, uh, metaphysics, um, kind of various topics. Um, and we would look at it primarily through uh, Christian authors, so Christian philosophy, but we would also see what the other authors had to contribute to the subject. Moving on from philosophy, when we went to theology, that's when you, you get more into the very specific religious topics. Um, you study scripture, you study theology, you study church history. Um, all of these, these different things to prepare you. And ultimately, the reason why they do philosophy and theology, I mean, theology helps us to be able to explain the faith to people who believe already. Um, if people believe in the Bible, then we can use scripture to talk to them um, about the faith. But if someone doesn't actually believe in scripture, you can't just start quoting it um, to try to, to talk about God to them. So you can go to philosophy, um, which doesn't depend upon scripture, which doesn't depend upon God revealing himself. It depends upon us looking at the world around us and seeing, okay, has God left imprints of himself in the world that we're able to glean and then show other people that, you know what, I believe in God not just because he revealed himself, but also because he showed himself to this world. And there are philosophers who thought of this independent of their Christian faith, or maybe they weren't even Christian. So that's why they do the complementary philosophy and theology. Okay, how did you deal, how did they tell you, or what was your training to deal with the atheists, the agnostics? Um, the atheists and agnostics, um, I would say that would be the philosophical training. Okay. Um, because in philosophy, the, the subject of God is treated um, based not on faith, but based on reason. So what can we reasonably conclude about God based on our reasonable analysis of the world around us? And so I would say that training, though it wasn't specifically geared and told, this is what you tell to an agnostic, this is what you tell to an atheist, just that the teaching of what philosophers have said prepares us so that when we encounter people who are agnostic and atheist, 
we at least have some common ground um, in which to speak. Okay, let's go on now to psychology. Well, of course, okay. is, is, was psychology a subject there? Um, in, in theology, uh, we had a pastoral psychology course. It was really just a dabbling, a very light dabbling in psychology. I mean, there's so there's a limited amount of time and so much, so many topics to cover when you're in seminary because of what a priest is going to encounter. That really, they just gave us a very basic introduction to psychology, um, but it really didn't go too deep. Okay, uh, like all human beings, priests, priests were probably going to a period of loneliness and depression, you know, how, it happens with all human beings, how did they, how did they tell you, or how did they tell you, preach to you, teach you how to handle such a situation like you? Yeah. It's kind of, I guess, you could divide it in two ways. Um, you can be depressed, feeling lonely, uh, either because you simply don't have the supports around you. So friends, uh, family, um, if you start isolating yourself. And so one of the things they said, just on a practical level, make sure that you're having regular contact with your classmates, the other priests that were with you, um, priests within the other churches that are near you, constantly visiting your family, or even families within the parish. So just making sure that you have a healthy social life with other people. That doesn't need to be, mean you need to be gregarious all the time. I mean, some people are introverts, but some human connections with these people. If you have none, then that's a sign that you need something is wrong. But can meditation, meditation, be a solution to that uh, that situation? Somebody would have found themselves being lonely. Well, that's where I would go into the the, the other aspect. So that's more of kind of the natural part of loneliness, uh, mm -hmm. simply being by yourself. The kind of more, I would say, spiritual element of loneliness um, can come from if you feel isolated from God. So maybe your spiritual life isn't going um, as you hoped it would. Um, sometimes the work of a parish, so all the things that you're doing, even if you're around people all the time, because it kind of takes up time, you forget to pray. You forget to continuously contact, keep in contact with the God whom you're serving. Um, and then you can get isolated. And so it could be a spiritual problem that is causing kind of this depression, uh, this heaviness within you. And really, you need to get back to the fundamental basics of, I entered into this priesthood to both serve God and his people. And if I completely forget about God and just focus on his people, then there's necessarily something that's going to go wrong. And so re-enkindling that spiritual life again was something they warned us about that can help. Okay. So they give you a defense mechanism against loneliness, I know. Okay. <laughs> they give us advice. Would you say that, is it? They give us advice about how to combat it, how to, to make sure that it doesn't Defense, happen. defense, yeah. How do you attack it? <laughs> defense and attack both. Okay, now, have you taken any vows of, you know, there are vows and so on, you know that? Uh, kind of, I've made promises. There's a slight difference um, between um, priests who join a religious community or, or monks in a monastery um, or nuns in a convent. They take vows um, and they'll take three. Uh, vows of poverty, meaning they won't own anything, vows of chastity, meaning they, they won't get married, um, and vows of obedience, meaning they will listen to their superiors. Um, a diocesan priest, so a priest that works in a parish and is part of a diocese, he takes uh, two promises, um, promise of obedience to the bishop um, and a promise of uh, chastity, meaning he that he won't get married. He doesn't take a promise of, uh, of poverty in part because he doesn't belong to a community like um, a nun in a convent or a, a priest that's part of a religious community would have. It's self-supporting. They, they kind of have a community, they, they uh, share everything in common. Yeah. That's because they live together and it's okay. easier for them. Diocesan priests, it's hard for us because we don't live together. We need some type of sustenance, some okay. way to pay. Uh, um, are you allowed to do anything like business or to supplement your income, some sort of other, except, um, 
activities as well, investments. You know, I think, well, I think priests do have kind of retirement, like we have a pension plan. Um, so we do in some, in that kind of respect, have investments. But nothing like a part-time job or so? No, be, because we consider this like a calling, a vocation, a vocation. we dedicate everything to it. Um, so I mean, we have hobbies on the side, um, mm -hmm. just like anyone does. But to try to invest kind of your life into something else, building up a corporation or a company, it just doesn't fit. The idea of priesthood. No, I'm not talking about that sort of investment. But that's you mean that you want to buy some uh, sort of a plan, an insurance plan, or no, you or, can you can do that. Uh, uh, would that those things are permissible? Yes, yeah, life insurance and things like that. Okay, okay, but not to do extra work like probably get an office job for two or three hours or so. Yeah, just I mean, there's tons, <laughs> there's tons of work. <laughs> Um, here as a priest, there's your, okay. your mission is never done. Okay, yes, I think you are fully occupied in your, this vocation is, yeah. a, is a calling. It is, it's a calling. People, so that you have to administer to your parish, attend to the sick, go to the hospitals. Right? I is apologize, home, I just received two phone calls that I just want to make sure. Okay, we just, oh, we have a wedding coming up, so, um, in a bit. Okay, okay. Well, I know you are very much occupied now, and I must. Um, do you want to say anything else? That okay. What is your? Um, how big is your parish? Ooh, actually, I'm I'm terrible with numbers. Um, it's it's two churches um, combined into mm -hmm. one parish. Um, but in terms of numbers, I really okay. I'm terrible at guessing, so I wouldn't be able okay. to give a justification. But it's, you are in full. Um, your service are in full demand here, uh, Certainly. Yeah, 24 hours sometimes. Now, can you tell me now, what are the services you perform as a priest? Well, I mean, the most important thing that we do is celebrate Mass, mm -hmm. um, and we do that every day. Um, we also hear confessions. Uh, that's, for Catholics, that's the, the means for which people come to receive the forgiveness mm -hmm. of their sins. Um, we also we do marriages, funerals. Um, we work within the schools, um, so we're preparing uh, both teaching young people and then those who are receiving certain sacraments like first communion or confirmation. We prepare them for that. Um, we do a whole host of things. It's it's hard to kind of encapsulate all of it, and it changes throughout the year as as we go through Christmas time, as we go through Easter time, and all of this. So those um, the students who studied with you. They are, everybody graduated, eh? Uh, Nobody not, is. Not everyone who started, actually. Um, mm. There's a lot of young men who go in, they're very generous with their time, um, and they want to give an opportunity for God to um, kind of use them, work with them. Mm. And they think that God is calling them, but they're not quite sure. And they go into seminary, and they find out very clearly, you know what, this isn't where God is calling me. Um, they went in with a generous heart, and God made it clear to them while they were in there. Okay, um, so how many years did you spend in this seminary? In total, I spent eight years. Eight years, that's, that's about, um, that's about a, a lot of years, eh? And you did, um, those are the biggest book about, but did it teach you public speaking or so? Like, we did uh, have a, a public speaking course, and then courses on the homily in particular, so when the priest preaches. Um, having to write them and, and getting them critiqued by your classmates. Mm -hmm. So we had a lot of preparation in that. Okay. Now is that difficult to hear? Pardon? It was difficult, you think? Um, for some people it was. For myself, I mean, it's always nerve-wracking when you go up and, and speak in front of people, but I mean, in the end, I at least know I can do it. I, uh, okay. I'll be able to get through it. <laughs> so, um, what in the priesthood, eh? you're a man who, 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 I can't call you a man, but you are a God gifted I, I person. Am, I am not a God. <laughs> a God gifted person. Yes, uh, God has gifted me and blessed me. Excellent. So, what do you project yourself, or what is your ambition <laughs> to, to reach at what height in this priesthood? Well, I think in a sense, I've already reached the height. Um, God had given me the gift of priesthood. My goal is really to live it out faithfully for the rest of my life. If God calls me to other things, I mean, I'm open to that, but 
I'm right now. I'm just happy where I am. Okay, yeah, just a piece, but um, it, administratively, there's a hierarchy in the um, Catholic Church. From priesthood, where do you go to? Uh, you go to bishop. Okay. You go to cardinal. Go to pope. <laughs> yes. um, well, sometimes I see you address you as a pope. Is that possible? Um, theoretically, yes. <laughs> um, okay. But <laughs> it's <laughs> practically it would be impossible. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah. Okay, well, I must thank you very much. Do you have any advice for people who wish to join the priesthood? Well, my, my main piece of advice would be for anyone, whether they're thinking of joining the priesthood or just trying to figure out what it is um, that they're supposed to do with their lives, ask God. Mm -hmm. I mean, He made you. He knows what He made you for. Um, and He'd be happy to let you know, because ultimately that's what's going to make you happy. So. Ask him, and don't just ask him once, ask him again and again and again. Because every time you ask, your heart kind of grows, and it wants to know the answer even more and more and more. And eventually when it's big enough to hold what it is that God has to give to you, um, then God will give it. So keep asking him, keep asking him. He wants you to be happy, and he wants you to find your calling in life. Um, and he'll be the one to call you to it. So that's my advice. Okay, well... Okay, I must thank you very much, Father. Because you have a very, um, you're, you're fu suffused with divinity, looking at you. When I came here, you had a glow about your body that, um, that shone this whole place lit up. When you shook my hand, I felt a vibration, as though the spirit within you uh, touched me. And the conversation here was spiritual. And the conversation before we started the taping, um, I got to know more about you. In fact, the first time I met you was at a, a, a funeral, a viewing of a body. And I had a, I saw you there and I just approached you and a lot of people wanted to see you. But you spent about 10 minutes with me when you had other commitments. I must commend you for having chosen the path to heaven and to lead people in that direction. Thank you, sir. And I'm very enthused with the way you approach life. And you have, how you have um, surmounted all the hurdles that were placed in your path. And how God, how you beg God in meditation. And he answered your prayer. To be a priest. I must thank you very much, Father. You're very well, welcome. I think we shall. I will let I can take a picture with you here. Okay, let's see there if I can. Okay.